<laughs> All right. Cool. We've got uh, Nate Foster, professor at Cornell. Uh, Super expert in programming languages and all things in programming languages meets SDN. He's uh, um, well known for uh, being one of the leaders of the Frenetic project, uh, which also we're learning about in the class. So, um, thanks, Nate, for for um, hopping on to answer some questions today and, and chat. Thank you. Cool. So, um, so I'm curious, uh, uh, what? Your your background certainly in in programming languages, but you you definitely have been uh, pretty pretty deep into networking the past couple of years with the Frenetic project. I'm wondering what led you to to start working on it. Um, you know what what kind of made you jump the fence over to networking? What were the initial goals of the project? You know, and and, and more importantly, it's still going on, right? So how is it how is it changing and evolving as as the project continues? Yeah, so I'll tell you a bit of personal history uh, as you alluded to. Um, my background was really in programming languages and, and somewhat towards the theoretical end of things in functional programming and type systems um, and quite a bit away from systems and networking. Um, but there were two things that kind of led me to start working in this area. So um, one was that uh, UPenn made a, a hire uh, towards the end of my PhD um, hiring Boon Tao Lu. Um, so Boon did his PhD at, at Berkeley. Um, I think he was supervised by Joe Hellerstein. Um, but he was working on this project called declarative networking, where they were using a logical programming language uh, called a variant of Datalog to write distributed routing protocols. Um, and I thought this was just incredibly cool, um, the idea that you could take kind of the core pieces of these really complex things like, like BGP uh, and, and encode them in a very beautiful way um, as a, a logic language uh, and then... Um, you know, optimize it and analyze it and prove things about it. Um, I thought this was just a really cool connection. Um, so I was already kind of, uh, you know, intrigued by by that kind of marriage of a very applied area uh, being treated by some um, quite formal techniques. Um, and then as I was finishing my PhD, I was poking around for postdocs and um, and wrote to Dave Walker at Princeton and said, "Are you hiring postdocs?" And he said, "Well, I'm going to be away next year." But uh, my colleague, Jan Rexford, is looking for someone in programming languages to start working on uh, developing languages for this new kind of network architecture. If you're interested in learning something new, this might be fun. Um, and so that was uh, that led me to sort of make a jump. And I think, um, I guess, uh, in general advice for kind of grad students, I mean, I think whenever you can find areas where there's, um, you know, maybe you have some training in an area and can, can find a, another area of CS where your tools can apply, uh, this can be a really powerful combination. Um, gives you really you usually have a, a fresh perspective on things, um, but also you you learn a lot about stuff that you probably don't have much expertise in, um, and so it can really stretch you in interesting ways. Um, so that's the personal side of things. I think the um, <laughs> the the vision. I mean, really, uh, I can Jen Rexford, who was my postdoc supervisor, um, I think had the vision that that there would be some interesting problems with uh, SDN that uh, some language techniques might uh, might help with. Um, and I can't take any credit for that because that was completely her vision. Um, as far as like our, our initial goals for the project, um, we really started out just trying to write some programs. So I, you know, initially um, I, I spent a few months just trying to uh, take Knox, which was the first open source SDN controller, and just try to write some software in it and sort of you know see what works well and what doesn't. Um, and the thing that very quickly we discovered was that um, Knox's programming model provided very little in the form of uh, modularity. Um, so I don't know if you've covered Knox in the class or not, but um, yeah. Yeah. So, so Knox and, and many other controllers basically would you know, receive the network events in the form of OpenFlow messages and then pass them up a chain of event handlers. And so if you were writing a network program, what you would do was write the code for those handlers and then choose you know, for each element of the chain, whether or not to propagate the event up. Um, so already you kind of have these dependencies between different bits of code because one handler installed below you might obscure your visibility if you're a module sitting higher up the chain into events that you want to see. Another problem is that each of these elements of these chains, these modules, are actually installing rules in the flow tables of switches. And so and, and they don't really have any protocol by which they can negotiate you know, when it's OK to install a particular rule or not. Um, and so you can get this kind of interference between modules where 
you know, one module might want to block traffic, and another module might want to forward it. And if they both just install rules, you know, whichever rule gets there last is going to be the one that takes effect. Um, and so, you know, some experience kind of trying to write programs and, and discovering that, oh, it's actually really tricky to kind of separate out the different concerns uh, for different modules and then turn that into running code uh, led us to think about, well, what if we sort of move to a different programming model where um, instead of responding to events and manipulating forwarding tables, we could describe at a higher level of abstraction which functions we want the network to implement. And once we make that shift, we can then start to think about different ways of combining functions uh, that would correspond to sort of module composition operators. Um, and that was kind of, then, then we were kind of off to the races. Are there, are there are these kinds of abstractions and modules that you realized were, were appropriate for these kind of problems? Are, are they similar to, to the, you know, hammers that you've used to solve other kinds of problems in programming languages? Or were there kind of specific things in networking, in these networking problems where you find, found that you needed you know, new, new types of, of, uh, of tools? Um, in other words, like, were there sort of new things that you had to put in the PL toolbox to, to solve these problems? Yeah, so, so two things I'd, I'd say here. So one, um, one thing I think has been exciting about the work that uh, many different groups have been doing in this area is actually discovering connections to other areas in programming languages that existed before anyone thought about using them for networking. Mm -hmm. um, so one example that, that we've done in our work is, um, I think we'll, we'll talk about this later, is uh, there's a system called Clean Algebra with Tests, uh, which was developed in the context of theoretical computer science. Um, and, and we discovered that our our functional language we were using to write SDN programs matched up quite nicely with these cleaning algebras with tests. And that was really a quite surprising connection, um, but it, it worked quite precisely. And once you do that, um, you can then take advantage of all of the um, theorems and program transformations and optimization techniques and you know all, all of the results that have been developed really for decades in this other area of CS and start applying them to networking. Um, so that, that's one example of um, of sort of, I think, a, a nicely designed language that connects up to some existing theory can, can provide you a lot of benefit. Um, the other area where I think you see a lot of commonalities with, with other research is um, in the area of kind of languages for distributed systems um, and program partitioning. Um, so this is, the, the domain is completely different, but um, if you look at some work that um, Sam Madden at MIT and my colleague Andrew Myers have been doing, um, they've been looking at how you could take a program running on a database, and that program might be expressed in a language like Java, and automatically partition it into two programs, one that runs in, the, in Java and one that runs on the database. And the idea is that the database probably has some specialized um, code and data structures and so on to deal with massive data sets, and so it'll be much faster. But the Java code is, of course, much more flexible because it provides you know, a general purpose language. And so this challenge of how you kind of write one description and then split it into two or more pieces um, for efficiency often uh, is, is something that's arisen a lot. Um, other examples are, are web programming. So people have written, developed languages where you can describe a web application sort of in one piece of code and then split it out into, you know, JavaScript code that runs in the browser, Java code that runs on the server, maybe some database code that runs in the back end. Um, and some of the languages for SDN that have been developed have the same kind of flavor. So you can write one program, and then a compiler is going to partition it into a piece that runs on the controller, and then hopefully a larger piece that runs on the network devices. And the network devices, of course, are much more efficient at, at doing packet processing, and so uh, they'll handle the majority of the work. But some of the work that can't be compiled to the switches will run on the controller. Cool. I just had one one question about the the sort of cleaning algebra with tests. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know too much about the theory myself, but I'm I'm wondering like, um, do you think it was an accident that that uh, that that construct mapped really well to to networking and SDNs in particular, or the types of problems that it was being used to solve before analogous to to networking problems, or was it an accident, or or, or uh, why did, why was the mapping so good? I think um, in hindsight, it's 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 fairly obvious, and it's not an accident. Um, and, and actually quite similar formalisms have come up in the networking community in the past. Um, so of course there's 
um, lots of people who have used um, you know, linear algebra types of techniques or automata theoretic techniques to model a network. Um, and this kind of duality between matrices and graphs is something that you know, scientific computing people and linear algebra people have been doing for, for a long time. Um, and, and clean the algebra with tests is based on, it's, it's kind of, it's an algebraic presentation of, um, of finite state automata from formal language theory. And, and those are also a kind of graph. And you can play the same games transforming between an algebraic program type representation of the thing you're trying to describe, an automata theoretic machine description of the thing you're trying to describe, and perhaps even a matrix representation of the thing you're trying to describe. And these shifts of perspective you know, reveal different aspects of the system, um, but, but they're all precisely connected to each other. Um, and I'd say, you know, once you realize that sort of all of these different formalisms are ways of describing paths through graphs, um, at that high level, uh, it's completely unsurprising that, that this connection exists and is so precise. Um, just to mention one other piece of work that um, is, is based on similar insights. Um, Tim Griffin at Cambridge and others did some work on meta routing about 10 years ago now, um, and and he's really playing in the same space. Um, so looking at, you know, what are the uh, algebraic operators that uh, determine things like path selection and so on, and how do when you start combining paths and preferences on paths, um, what what structure arises from that? And it's it's much of the same underlying formalism. Interesting. Cool. Um, Actually, I, I know beyond the languages themselves that you've developed, you've, you've also you, you've developed some uh, some formalisms and, and compilers and, and things that kind of relate to your languages. And, and there's sort of a whole family of stuff around around frenetic. Um, there's uh, there's there's the, the pyretic stuff, which actually the the students in the class will will um, will use. To actually, um, you know, uh, some people have had a super crash course in Python, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're they're playing around with that, but but also there's there's frenetic, and then there's also netcore and netcat, and I was just wondering, um, what are the relationship between all of them, um, and and then how how do you decide which which tool or language to use or, or study? I, I imagine, of course, like frenetic and pyretic are are languages, and it's it'd be interesting to to hear your thoughts on that. But then there's also are these are these uh, theories um, things that that people should should appreciate and pay attention to as they're as they're using the language. I mean, uh, can you talk about kind of like can you talk? This is not just a an ordinary language. This isn't sort of programming in open daylight, as it were. Um, this is something else, right? So, can you can you speak a little bit about these this whole family? Yeah. So, um, I think uh, part of the part of the reason for this question is is our fault that we've kind of confusingly named things at various times and reused names and. Uh, so it's, it can be tricky to figure out exactly what name maps to which system, um, and they also all overlap with each other. Um, so the, the way that we're trying to describe things right now is that um, frenetic is this umbrella term for a project that spans uh, several different universities, uh, Princeton, Cornell, uh, there's people at UMass now using this, this stuff uh, also in Belgium. Um, and so frenetic is kind of this umbrella term for, for all of these languages. Um, pyretic is a system that... Uh, Josh Reich and Jen Rexford and Dave Walker uh, have been leading at Princeton, um, which is trying to realize sort of the, the um, general idea of kind of having high-level languages uh, for networking in the context of Python. Um, so um, in, in Pyretic, you write a Python program that uses some of the languages that we've developed for describing packet forwarding as a domain-specific library within Python. Um, and, and then there's a bunch of um, runtime system functions and so on that are packaged with that to let you write effective dynamic programs. Um, there's another implementation of Frenetic in OCaml that we've been developing here at Cornell uh, in collaboration with folks at UMass. Um, and, and that's sort of a, a, a similar system, but it's done in a functional language. Um, and um, so, it, you know... I suspect for most for most of your students and for lots of people from the systems community, you know, Python is a, a thing they're familiar with, and so it it's easy to get going with um, using some of the uh, language constructs in Frenetic in that environment. Um, but if you're brave and enjoy functional programming, uh, we have a, a version in Camel as well. Um, Netcore and Netcat are are sort of two points in an evolution of this of sort of our core functional language for describing packet forwarding and querying. Um, so um, 
there are some differences, uh, and I don't want to kind of take you through the nitty gritty details of sort of a, a intellectual history of kind of how these things evolved, but um, Netcore is an early version, um, and then Netcat was a, a later version. Um, I guess the precise difference between uh, Netcore and Netcat, so Netcore was um, a language trying to give you a functional interface to writing packet processing functions in an entire network. So really the model here is instead of writing programs that produce rules that get installed on switches, you write programs that describe some mathematical function. And this function is what's applied to packets everywhere in the network. Um, so, so you write this function, you run it, and the compiler is going to take care of how to of partitioning that into flow tables for all the switches uh, in a way that implements that function. <coughs> um, Netcore included a few operators for combining functions. Um, the the first was what what's sometimes called parallel composition or union, and this lets you basically take two functions on packets and produce a bigger function on packets. So, um, and the idea is that these these two programs sort of operate in parallel on different copies of the packet. So this kind of operator is useful if you want to do something like take one function that implements some kind of monitoring function and another function that implements some kind of forwarding function, and you want your network to do both of those things. So if you use parallel composition, you can merge these two functions together, and you get a bigger function that does both of those things. Um, the other operator in Netcore is something called uh, sequential composition, which is just like normal sequential composition from ordinary programming. And instead of running two programs side by side, this operator feeds the outputs of the first function into the inputs of the second. Um, so this would be useful if you want to do something like you have a firewall and you want to make sure the firewall is always applied. Well, if you compose the firewall after the rest of your program, you'll be assured that the firewall program is always applied, and any packets that it drops will not be forwarded. Um, and there's other examples. Um, so Netcore really had kind of a little language for describing you know, packet predicates and modifications, and then these sequential and parallel composition operators. Um, Netcat uh, went a step further in adding um, a Cleany star operator. So if people have seen um, formal language theory, Cleany star is an is an operator that lets you do things zero or more times. You can think of it as kind of like a for loop, um, but you do it kind of as many times as possible. Um, and uh, this, uh, this has two main uses. Uh, so one use is if you want to model the behavior of an entire network as a program, then you'd like to be able to encode the possibility of packets being processed as many times as they need to be. So for example, if, you're, if your network has a loop um, and you want to model that in a language, you need some ability to express unbounded iteration. Um, and without Clean Star, you can't do that. Um, so Netcat adds that operator. Another use, which I think I believe you've, you've looked at in your work on uh, software-defined exchanges, is you could imagine an exchange that's hosting programs from different parties, and you'd like to let them interact with each other, um, sending traffic back and forth to each other zero or more times. And although there's some upper bound that any given program will need to send packets back and forth between those different tenants, um, it's convenient to not have to do that on rolling by hand and just to say, you know, let customers A, B, and C forward packets to each other until they're done. Right, right. Um, That's so I guess w one other difference with Netcat is um, it's, it's really, um, I guess as I started to allude to, you can use it both as a programming language so you can write functions in it and compile them to, to rules that on switches, and, and we've done this. Um, and you can also use it as a reasoning framework. So it, it kind of is this formalism that kind of blurs the line between a language and a, a reasoning framework. And so um, there's one of the exciting things about SDN from the PL perspective is um, people have started to get serious about things like network verification. And you, I've, there's some really great work by... Um, uh, Payman, uh, Kazimian, and Nick McEwen out of Stanford on header space analysis. Um, also, George Fargazi. Um, and there's some also, also nice work out of UIUC, um, Matt Caesar and Brighton Bright Godfrey on Veriflow and Anteater. Um, and so these are systems where you can automatically, uh, in a push button way, you know, check properties of, of a network program. 
Um, and a lot of these tools work by translation into other representations for which we have algorithms that can decide um, various properties. So for example, you could take your configuration and encode it as a problem for a SAT solver. And SAT solvers are very fast these days, and so if you can do that kind of encoding, then you can turn a question about a network into a question about satisfiability. <coughs> so Netcat is designed to be the same thing. So it has, um, it has a, a set of algorithms that can be used to decide when two programs are equivalent. And so you can do a lot of this reasoning in the language as well. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to, to ask a few more things about yeah. about verification. I mean, this, this seems to be like a super hot topic. Actually, the difference, one of the main differences between the course this year and last year is that I've added a whole module on verification. Okay. Talk a bunch of the things that you mentioned. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, and and I think there's a lot of stuff you know that we could talk about there as far as like, um, you know, the thing maybe I'd I'd like to ask a little bit about the types of things you can currently verify, the types of things you'd like to verify but you can't. Um, I mean, w w what about that? Um, it's like you mentioned, for example, certain types of things can be translated into things like uh, that a SAT solver could solve, and you know, those tend to be, you know, things like data plane, you know, reachability in the data plane, and things yep. like that. Um, and the header space analysis work sort of is, you know, symbolic execution again on packets in the data plane. Um, what are your thoughts on just, you know, wh what's the current state of things you can verify or not verify? And and then my follow up is like, what about control plane verification? Like, you know. Is, are there? Do we have ways of verifying like what the controller is going to do at a certain point in time? Yeah. So uh, there's a bunch of questions there, and I think the the overall like high bit is uh, at least to me it's super exciting that so many people both on the PL side and verification side and on the networking side have gotten interested in this topic. Um, there's um, uh, you know, verification has been going on in networks for a long time. Uh, I know you did some work at MIT <laughs> during your grad school days on this, um, but it seems like there's really kind of a broad base of people who are interested from the very academic side, but also people trying to really deploy this uh, in operational contexts, and, and that's super exciting. Um, so as far as the kind of lay of the land, um, I think w one useful division is, is the one you said. So there's a bunch of tools that are doing data plane verification, um, and, you know, so they're, they're not modeling the controller, um, but they're taking, you know, a snapshot of the network state, so what is the topology, and what are the configurations of all the switches, and then answering questions about uh, what that snapshot does in terms of packet processing. So properties like um, reachability, or loop freedom, or isolation, um, these tools will often have ways of encoding those properties um, and then and then checking them automatically. Um, and uh, this is a, in, in some sense, you could call this low-hanging fruit. I mean, it's kind of, these problems are, everything is, you know, finite state at this level, and um, there are great uh, low-level tools that can decide properties uh, very efficiently, so things like SAT solvers and model checkers. Um, but there's still a lot of cleverness and, and research that goes into building uh, a tool that can scale to the size of a campus or data center or enterprise network and answer these questions. Um, and so, you know, uh, work like Headerspace and, and Anteater and so on and Veriflow, um, they have a bunch of really cool insights uh, to kind of take this problem that if I just describe it from the high level, sounds quite straightforward and, and make, it, make it fast and effective. Um, the other side of things uh, is, well, you know, you might ask the question, why start from a snapshot of, of the topology and the state of the network? Because, well, you know, even, even getting that snapshot in a consistent way is going to be hard. And there's this controller that's doing things, and there's things happening in the network. Um, and so I think kind of the next major leap is moving to doing uh, both controller verification and um, modeling the chaotic state of the network. Um, with, with things like failures and congestion and, and so on. Um, so on the, on the controller verification side, um, there's um, some really great work going on right now. Um, so there was some early work by, by Jen Rexford and Marco Canini and uh, some others um, where they were using symbolic execution of the control program itself to check that uh, certain invariants were not violated. Um, and uh, this is sort of hard for all of the usual reasons that 
uh, software verification is hard. Um, you know, taking taking an arbitrary C++ or Python program and trying to prove it does anything um, is is incredibly difficult. Um, and so there's um, there's there's a sort of good bag of tricks now that you can start to use to throw at this problem. <coughs> so things like um, starting to abstract away from the um, from the actual program itself and building a simpler model that's more tractable for analysis. Uh, this is a field that's kind of been developed over the past 30 years in, in programming languages, and tools like NICE start to apply this to um, control programs. Um, there's some other work. I'll just mention some names, and then we can go deeper, uh, depending on what you think is interesting. Um, so there's uh, a group um, led by uh, Muli Sagiv, who's a professor in Israel, um, as well as a bunch of people at MSR, um, so uh, Tom Ball and Nikolai Bjorner and others, um, that uh, are working on also controller verification. Um, and they found some interesting, um, some interesting constraints in the problem. So for example, um, if you're trying to verify a control program, um, there's a certain class of properties that are actually independent of the topology. Um, so there are properties you can prove of a control program uh, and the network state that it produces, uh, where even if the topology is changing, uh, you know that property can be proved or disproved, um, and that's a important case to handle because um, the controller may not have you know complete consistent visibility into the state of the topology, and so that kind of verification result, although it limits the kind of properties you can talk about, um, you know does does give you an answer that uh, that you can believe with high confidence. Um, another group that's working on controller verification is uh, is a group at Brown. Uh, so Shriram Krishnamurthy and his students um, have been building a program, a language called Flowlog, um, which is a language based on on data log, like the work by Boon Tai Lu I was talking about. Um, so the idea is that you write a single, they call it tierless program, um, where you you just write you know a stateful program. It might they might build up some tables with information learned from the network. It describes the forwarding behavior of the network uh, as well. Um, and then you can verify that data log program uh, to check certain invariants. And, um, and so again, it's you know, not just verifying the actual state of the network, but also what happens dynamically over time uh, in the control plane. Um, going further, um, I think a really rich area is getting away from, from individual packet properties. So a, a lot of these, um, well, one interesting way to sort of classify formal verification efforts is if you're verifying something, you're probably verifying some kind of logical property. And that property probably has the form, you know, for all something, <laughs> and then some constraints on that thing. Um, and a lot of these tools that have been developed so far can, can prove properties about for all single packets you know, something happens. So for all single packets, if that packet is located at this switch, it will eventually be delivered to this switch. Or, you know, for all packets, and for any switch actually, you know, this packet cannot loop back to the same switch. Um, but if you want to talk about other properties like um, fault tolerance or various things that I'll lump under QoS, then it's not enough to talk about a single packet. Um, you may have to talk about um, what happens with multiple packets, or um, also things about the, the network topology itself. Um, and so I think another kind of big step, in addition to kind of extending to control, control plane verification, is extending to these richer classes of properties. Yeah, no, that, that, that definitely makes sense. You've, you've, done, um, you've done a little bit of work on... on fault tolerance yourself, it seems like that's one kind of dynamic, um, uh, one kind of dynamic event that might occur is, is links going up and down. Um, it seems like, um, you know, there, there, there are certainly big challenges there. I mean, you've sort of said a few times, like, okay, you, you want to have some, some notion that, that a particular property holds, you know, under a certain set of conditions. Um, as far as fault tolerance is concerned, what can you say? Um, can you say, for example, when this link fails, like I, I, you know, get certain uh, security properties, or I get certain, 
you know, load balance properties, or are we not there yet? Like, what kind of things can you say with, with fault tolerance at this so point? There, yeah, there's certainly some things you can do sort of reducing to these single packet properties. Um, so the kind of thing that we've proved before in, in our work, which, which does concern these kind of single packet uh, functions and properties, is, you know, does this program behave a certain way? So does it provide connectivity, for example? In this topology, even if up to k links fail, um, and so that, you know, you can ask a series of questions um, and basically reduce that kind of question to um, single packet properties. Um, it's not a particularly efficient way to do things, but uh, it, it at least gives you an algorithm. Um, my own opinion, and this is not an area I've really started to work in yet, but I think it's a really exciting area, is um, moving to um, probabilistic languages and probabilistic guarantees. Um, I think at a certain point, these models based around deterministic packet forwarding, um, if, you, if you kind of continue trying to sort of model every aspect of the network as a, some kind of deterministic operational model, um, it's just going to get too complicated to do at scale. Um, and so one way to abstract things is to basically elide some of the det details about how things like buffers and queues and maybe even failures behave and replace them instead with um, with some kind of probabilistic entity. So maybe you know maybe you model um, distributions on on packets that are arriving in the network. Maybe you model things uh, like uh, expected rates of failures, um, and then um, sort of replay the whole the whole game of coming up with languages and formalisms and algorithms um, that can give you these kinds of probabilistic guarantees. Um, so this uh, also connects. There's there's a lot of interest right now in the PL community in um, in languages whose semantics is based on probabilistic foundations. Um, a lot of this is driven by uh, interest in machine learning, um, mm -hmm. but it seems like uh, networking is is another area where where these kinds of um, structures would would be quite useful. Yeah, that seems that seems really interesting. I mean, I, it's I guess that answered another one of my questions, that, uh, which was sort of like. Uh, in your working on this type of thing, like what kinds of things are feeding back into the into the programming language community? Um, I guess that that might be one um, sort of. Uh, um, but are, are there others? I mean, things that basically in working on. I mean, is the programming language another way of asking it? I guess is the programming language community are they paying attention to this a lot and sort of taking things back and and developing, you know. Um, you know, new languages or, or, or techniques or, or models? I, I, I mean, <laughs> I hope that some people uh, are getting interested in this stuff. Um, I can point to specific individuals. Um, actually, uh, Jen Rexford was invited to give a, a keynote at the flagship theoretical PL conference, um, and I think that helped get a lot of people interested in, in, in my community and, you know, oh, yes, that's an interesting kind of, of device to want to program, and uh, so I, I think that kind of uh, whetted people's appetite for this kind of work. Um, there are a few people, I've, I've already mentioned most of their names, who actually have made the jump and started doing research in this area. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, slowly there's there's some interest in, um, cool. in people starting to do this. I, I will say there's, you know, some of the people who are doing this are the kinds of adventurous researchers who like looking for new areas to work in. Um, mm -hmm. but I can also point to a few, a few examples. Um, so for example, our work on cleaning algebra is uh, done, done here at Cornell with, with colleagues at Princeton. Um, actually roped in my colleague, Dexter Cozen, who's a theoretician. Um, he's actually giving a talk tomorrow at the Mathematical Foundations of Program Semantics on, on NetCat. Um, and I, it's a little hard for me to quantify, but like this is an area of CS that's so far away from <laughs> systems and networking, um, and yet you know one of the invited talks will be on uh, uh, you know, a language approach to how you program these things. Um, so, I, I'd say, I guess, in terms of like impact in PL, I, I don't think, you know, it's not like there's um, PL conferences devoted to SDN popping up yet, but um, not so. yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that that's a, yeah, that's a good good point. Where I, I I thought I might ask some questions kind of in the other direction. I mean, you you kind yeah. of referred to to some work. Um, that we did like way back in MIT. And actually, I was super excited when I started to see your work because, like, when we did some some debugging and testing work way back when, 
I was like, you know, this is pretty hard. Like, really, what we should do is just like start over and have a language that like actually makes sense. And 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 I think the, the kind of the responses I got at the time uh, were sort of like, yeah, but but operators are going to have to like learn this new language, and they already know Cisco CLI and blah 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 blah. Like, you know, you shouldn't really work on this because like, you know you're going to be judged by adoption and things like that. Obviously, like, in your community, you don't actually, uh, you know, there are other, there's sort of other, let me, let me put that a different way. There, there are other ways that you can kind of, like, you know, you um, make meaningful contributions. Like, in systems and networking, I think we, we sort of, like, often measure ourselves by, like, you know, uh, I'll, I'll the, see. is the networking real world, like, paying attention to us here? Um, and, and one of the things that I noticed, like, in teaching the class here, um, not only that, but just, just sort of the, the vibe I get, like you know, from, as as this material gets out there, is like, for example, people are like, why are we programming in Pyretic, and like, why, you know, can't you put in more stuff on Open Daylight and this and that, and and um, you know, and 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 also like, uh, there are a lot of people taking the class who basically network people have basically been running networks for 20, 30 years, um, who have not basically written a line of Python until they took the class here, and I think some of the some of the comments I was getting like 10 years ago or more are pretty accurate. Um, I don't, I, I don't know, I think probably you and I may be biased for like, okay, it's probably inevitable, like, you know, this community is going to have to learn to program one, day, one way or another, but, and, but that seems to be happening a little bit with, with things like Open Daylight and stuff, but I guess my, I've got a number of questions sort of baked in there. One is like, is it inevitable, like, you know, are our network operators going to have to learn to program? I mean, should we basically tell them to take their lumps here and, and, and do the assignments? Uh, or um, or not, and then and then I think the other question, which is specific to, to your work, is um, there's this whole other juggernaut going on with with open daylight and, and a bunch of other stuff, and and they don't have this sort of uh, you know beautiful theory under under the hood. And um, what do you, I mean? What do you make of that actually? Um, uh. So a bunch of things. So so first, I'll I'll say the line that you said, <laughs> or that you didn't say rather. Um, <laughs> One, one can do PL research, and it can have no chance of adoption, and the community will still accept it if there's some nice theory. And I think um, that's perhaps an extreme, um, and uh, I sometimes wish that the programming languages community would be a little, would pay a little bit more attention to things that practitioners are doing. Um, you know, across our, our, you know, our field should be about programming. Um, and and what you described, where you know the networking community. Can can often push back in the other direction that if something is not um, sort of ready to be deployed on a short schedule, then it's probably not worth doing research in. You know that's also not necessarily healthy. Um, mm -hmm. The programming languages take a long time to get out there. So um, just a, an anecdote, not from the SDN area, but Apple announced this Swift programming language. That, you know, uh, at last week um, or a couple weeks ago, and um, there was a lot of Sort of discussion of this uh, in in various PL uh, social networking and things, and a, a lot of the comments were of the form sort of you know this is a really nice language based on technology fr from sort of 1980 or maybe 1985, um, and so there is this sense that kind of PL ideas take a long time to sort of get into practice, um, and um, I think you know 30 years is is probably too long, um, and I think there's there's other reasons that in the context of general purpose languages. Um, like like you know C++ and and Swift and so on, Objective C that these things take so long to get into practice, um, mostly because there's so much you know inertia and sort of friction to getting new features in. Um, I I certainly hope that at a time of transition um, there might be an opportunity to sort of um, help design some of the core abstractions in a way that uh, that, that you know make, makes sort of get some good design in at the right time. Um, so uh, that, that's sort of a rambly answer to sort of, um, you know, what are our thoughts about um, sort of how to, how people should think about um, different languages that are being proposed and when they might be useful. Um, in terms of things like um, Open daylight and some of the commercial grade controllers that are starting to come down the pike. Um, I think um, there's two reasons that people might be interested in some of the more academic languages that have been proposed. Um, so one is that um, 
languages like Netcat, we've actually carefully designed them to try to allow sort of incremental adoption. Um, and I'll say what that means precisely. So um, Netcat actually includes um, open flow forwarding tables as a, as a special sort of sub-language within the language. So if you constrain yourself to only use certain operators in a certain constrained way, you can basically program tables. Now, once you have those tables, you can also do things like combine them with parallel and sequential composition, and the compiler will happily handle them. Um, and you can, of course, also not write things in terms of tables. If you don't like writing tables, which are kind of verbose to write, you can write functions that describe tables. Um, but one of the things that that we would like to do, and, and some people are starting to do, is to actually, you know, you can use a language like Netcat as a kind of intermediate language for other formalisms. So you may not be writing Netcat code yourself, but at some point, you know, a Netcat-like language might be um, incorporating the tables that your, your code is producing and then doing further transformations on them and then spitting out, ultimately, uh, lower level configuration instructions. Um, and so, you know, under, for, for someone who, you know, just wants to be able to write operational code, um, certainly, you know, knowing a lot about things like open daylight is important. Um, but I, I think it may also be useful to understand some of the underlying sort of structure of what are these objects that you're really working with when you write your code. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, if you're trying to get a network to perform some function, you know, understanding and having a, a kind of closed world view of, well, here is a way of describing functions. You know, this language gives you a way to describe functions. And a sort of ready-made, very simple theory for how you can think about those functions, transform them, mutate them, that can be a useful mindset to have, whether you're programming in a language like Pyretic or if you're programming in Open Daylight. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing it in Open Daylight, you won't you won't have the, the syntax sitting in front of you, but you can use some of the insights um, in, in your code. And You'll still have the concepts, much like yeah. people know how to read like lists and, yeah. and, and, and uh, red black trees and things like that. You, is that what you're saying? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would certainly, we, we, you know, we would love to see some of the ideas in, in Frenetic get pushed into some of these commercial grade controllers. Um, and uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to help make that happen, I would, I would love that. Um, we're starting some um, uh, some limited efforts in this in this direction right now. So um, we have a Google Summer of Code uh, student who's working on uh, OpenStack integration. Um, but you know this is a a long engineering battle that researchers uh, don't always have the resources to kind of carry out as as first thing. So um, absolutely, I don't make promises, but. Um, yeah, no, I think that's really valuable for, I mean, for, for a lot of the pe people at least taking the course, the, you know, they're, they're coming, you know, from the operator perspective and certainly from industry perspective, and, and yeah. I think that it's, it's, insights are really important, I think. Um, I, think I guess, like... Uh, also, like, a lot of these things are very simple. I mean, I, uh, Netcat is a language whose complete description fits on half a page. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying go off and learn Netcat, but I'm just saying, like, the advantage of some of these um, academic formalisms is they're really quite lean. So that's a weakness, of course, because they don't model lots of things that are important to producing you know, operational networks that perform the way you want. But for the things they are modeling, they do it in a very simple and lean way. And so if you can uh, internalize and, and learn those, those things, it can be a quite powerful tool that kind of cuts through a bunch of the complexity of, um, of kind of thinking about the low-level system all at once. Yeah, absolutely. I think personally, it would be uh, it would be great if if operators often were able to think at that level of abstraction. So that's that's really powerful. Um, actually, maybe we should close with with another area that's just a a, a complete morass, uh, okay. which is security. Um, and I, I think this is something which we really won't cover this year in the course, but maybe in future years. It's certainly a personal interest of mine. Uh, you know, t you know, working in the area myself, I, I sort of have an appreciation for how messy it is. Um, but I've also followed some of the work of, of, of some of your colleagues, you know, even at, at Cornell, who've done pretty awesome work in, in using language constructs to do information flow control and, and, and other things like that. I'm wondering if, I mean, it just seems like there's a super, like, gap to be filled there as far as, you know, people stop doing, like, uh, 
you know, nice formal system security work a while ago, and, and you know, when, when viruses and botnets came around, and I, I feel like, you know, it's, it's maybe time to go back to that. Uh, I mean, do, do you think that some of the, the, language, the languages that you've developed and the constructs, do, do you think that they already have things that could help us reason about security, or do you think that, that, they, should, that they could be extended in a certain way that would help us reason about certain properties? Um, yeah, I think uh, this is a, an exciting area that is pretty untapped, as you as you said. So um, I don't know how much your class knows about this notion of information flow and and uh, non-interference kinds of properties. So I'll give a short description. Um, so um, uh, in the 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 work that Andrew Myers and and others have done in the languages community, um, the the whole idea is that you can design a language and a type system that can prove to you that if your program passes the type checker, then it will not leak secrets. Um, so you can imagine a program that's guarding some database, and the database has you know, high security and low security and possibly other levels of information, and then you're running some program, and that program is going to feed in some web page. And so you want to make sure that the security, sorry, the, the secret parts of the database uh, are not published on the web. Um, and so what these languages let you do is, is basically analyze the program, and if it passes the type checker, then uh, the, the, you're guaranteed that uh, no secrets will be leaked. Um, the way this turns into a, a theorem is that there's a property called non-interference, um, which is the kind of main thing that you prove about these languages to show that they have the intended security property. And non-interference says, um, if you have an input to some program that consists of a mixture of high and low or many other levels, but let's just do high and low, high and low security data, then if the outputs can also be classified as being high and low security, then there's no way for high security inputs to affect low security outputs. And to put it another way, you know, you could completely delete the high security inputs, or you could replace them with garbage, or you could replace them with other different high security inputs, and the low security piece, the piece that you're going to publish, is not changed. Um, so we did in the in the work we did on Netcat, um, one piece of our paper actually used this kind of property uh, in order to reason about isolation between programs. Um, so the motivation here is, you know, if you have a, a shared network and you have multiple parties that are providing programs that are going to run on that shared network, you'd like to be sure that um, you have these kinds of non-interference properties between those programs. And you can actually talk about non-interference with respect to a couple of different properties. Um, and we use the kind of familiar terms from the security community of integrity and confidentiality. So in the domain of kind of network programming, one way to think about integrity is if my program is running in a network uh, alongside someone else, integrity means that that other program can't somehow produce inputs, namely packets, that would cause my program to behave differently. And confidentiality means that my program won't leak packets to another program that might be snooping and you know observing what traffic is is flowing through my program, um, and so you can. It turns out you can prove both of these kinds of properties uh, as as sort of using this framework of non-interference, um, and you can actually do it in a language like Net, uh, Netcat um, by uh, classifying certain kinds of packets as being high or low or belonging you know Nick's packets and Nate's packets. Um, and you can prove this kind of lack of interference between the two programs. Um, so this is one instance of this for kind of you know deterministic packet forwarding. Um, but there's a whole richer area um, which could extend to things like you could connect this up with um, with programs that are running on end hosts. So for example, you know you might have a database server and it might have a notion of high and low security data. And if the network was aware of that you know that certain packets. Uh, were, were high security packets, you could have a network that doesn't, you know, leak secret data. Um, and uh, this is, a, I think, a, a great area to work in and, um, uh, you know, kind of uniquely utilize the, the flexibility of SDN to start to explore these kinds of, you know, networks that provide richer properties um, than just back, best effort forwarding. Cool. Yeah, that seems like uh, it's it's a, a wide open area. Maybe yeah. maybe in the future will be uh, students will be hearing about that. <laughs> but we've got our work cut out for us. Awesome. Um, well, thanks. Uh, um, 
uh, thanks a lot for your time. I think uh, I think people really appreciate this. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, cool. All right. Cool. Thanks.